Welcome to Applied Strength of Materials for Engineering Technology. This series of videos supplements a course in Strength of Materials at Purdue University Fort Wayne, specifically designed for engineering technology students. This course uses algebra and trigonometry, but no calculus. The Creative Commons license mark at the lower left means that the content of this video series may be used by others, provided that content is used under a Creative Commons license no more restrictive than this one, and must include attribution. This set of videos was created in March and April of 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic when my school and many others switched to online teaching and learning. These videos were not professionally produced, but they cover all the material that I teach in face-to-face -face lectures at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. The sound quality is home quality, not studio quality. You may hear a cat every now and then. This course uses a free textbook available as a PDF file online the textbook is updated every semester based on feedback from my students. Some students prefer to use the PDF file on a laptop or tablet device, but you are welcome to print your own copy or have it printed at an office supply store. I recommend printing in color because all the diagrams use color. It's also available on Amazon.com but be sure to get the latest edition because it contains more information and fewer mistakes. If you hunt for the textbook online, you're likely to find a previous edition. Since this is a free PDF file, a number of open source textbook websites have included it, but for some odd reason, the sixth edition is the most commonly listed version. It's way out of date and is not as good as the most recent edition so use the link on this page. Here are some suggestions on using the videos. Take notes, rewind and replay as needed. Each slide in the video is marked by a page number in red at the lower right, so you can use it as a guide as you start and stop the video. Each video represents a full-length lecture in class, and sometimes two lectures. The videos only run a few minutes because time is not taken to write on a whiteboard, wait for students to copy information into their notes, answer questions, and so forth. It's a little like an NFL football game, which takes three hours to play, but there's only 60 minutes of actual game time. There have been many studies on how note-taking works. Most people think the point of taking notes is to create a reference document to help with homework and studying for exams. But there is another benefit. The act of writing notes helps your brain absorb the information into short-term memory. Educational research shows that taking notes longhand works better than taking notes in block capitals. Nobody knows why. Taking notes using a pencil or pen works better than typing on a laptop. Again, nobody knows why. I don't know if there's enough evidence to show the benefits or drawbacks of taking notes with a stylus on an electronic pad, but I do know that the least effective way to learn material from a class is to simply watch the video without taking any notes. Once upon a time, a student named Patrick took this class. Patrick is not his real name, but he did pretty well on the homework problems, and then crashed and burned on the exams. I asked, Patrick, what happened? He said, he doesn't do very well on tests. He just never does. The next semester, he retook the class and did pretty well on the homework, and aced all the exams, even though the problems were completely different. I asked, Patrick, what happened? He said, Professor, I followed your advice. I read the book. The most successful students in this class have told me that they read the book before the lecture so they have a better idea of what's going on and they can ask questions in class. 
They also said that office hours were really useful. A five-minute conversation can save an hour of frustration. If you can't make it to the office, use email. The book is laid out with all the terminology at the beginning. This is a list of the symbols used in the book, along with their names and typical units. Next, a list of definitions will help you if you don't remember the meaning of a concept that you saw three chapters ago. After the chapters is a set of appendices containing reference data that you'll need for solving the homework problems. I recommend printing them out. One thing missing from the textbook is the homework set, which I change every semester and hand out in class. The homework problems are not available online. Step two is to enter the numbers with units. For example, let's say the area of the circle is three square feet, and we want to know the diameter in inches. Plug in three square feet into the equation. Step three is to enter unit conversions. The trick here is to make sure that whatever you put in the numerator equals whatever you put in the denominator. In this case, 12 inches equals one foot. So if you put 12 inches up top, you can put one foot down below. It doesn't change the meaning of the equation. It's basically multiplying by one. The result doesn't change. We want to cancel feet squared, so we square the feet and we square the 12 inches. Notice we're squaring the number 12 as well as the unit, inches. Feet squared cancel, so we end up with the square root of inches squared, which gives us inches. If the units don't come out right, then look for a mistake in the algebra or in the unit conversions. One helpful technique is to cross out the units as they cancel. That way you can make sure that the unit in the final answer is in the equation and that all other units have canceled out. Here's an example from a topic that we'll see in Chapter 3, Thermal Expansion. When you heat up a piece of aluminum, it gets bigger. We can predict how much bigger using a simple equation. Greek lowercase delta is the change in length. Greek lowercase alpha is a materials property called the coefficient of thermal expansion, which you can find in Appendix B. L is the initial length, and delta T is the change in temperature. The question is, what is the final length? Start with the algebraic equation for the change in length. The final length is the initial length plus the change in length. Next, enter all the numbers with their units. There are no unit conversions to complete, so the answer is 36.01 inches. Here's an example from a topic that we'll see in Chapter 2, Tensile Stress in a Steel Bar. The stress in the bar has the tensile load P divided by the cross-sectional area of the bar, A. In this problem, we know how much stress the bar can handle, and we know how much load is applied. We want to know the cross-sectional area that can support this load. First, rewrite the algebraic equation to solve for the cross-sectional area, A. Second, introduce numbers and units. Third, Enter the unit conversion. One ton equals two kips. The result is 0 0.2 square inches. Steel is pretty strong stuff. This example is also from chapter two. A steel bar is loaded in tension, and we can use a formula to calculate how much it stretches. Let's say we know how much it stretches, what its cross-sectional area is, how long it is, and how stiff the material is. We want to find the load 
required to stretch this bar 2 millimeters. First, we write the equation to solve for tensile load P. Second, introduce numbers and units. Third, enter unit conversions until the only unit left is a unit of force. One key unit conversion is the definition of the metric unit of stress, the Pascal, which equals one newton per square meter. You'll probably find that problems in SI units take a few more unit conversions to solve. Here's a problem that will let you practice a little more algebra. The total surface area of this brick is two square feet, and the height, width, and depth of the brick are in proportion as shown. What's the dimension B in inches? Stop the video, work out an answer, then start the video again to see how your answer compares. Follow the three steps. First, figure out the algebra. The total surface area is top and bottom, front and back, left end and right end. It boils down to 28b squared. Solve for b algebraically. Enter the numbers and units. Then enter the unit conversion. The dimension b is 3.21 inches. Here's a practical design problem. You need a cylindrical tank with a volume of four cubic meters, and the ceiling limits the height of the tank to three meters. What diameter do you need to make it? Stop the video, solve the problem, then start it up again to see how your answer compares. As long as the cross-section is uniform, the volume of a cylinder is the cross-sectional area times the height, regardless of whether the cross-sectional area is a circle, a square, or some other shape. In this case, it's a circle. Solve the volume equation algebraically for diameter. Then introduce numbers and units. Then enter the unit conversion to get an answer of 130 centimeters. This method of unit conversion may seem too time-consuming when you can do simple unit conversions in your head. That's perfectly true, but the idea here is to practice on simple problems so you're really good at it once you get to complex problems. On the exams in my course, half of the credit is for getting the algebra right. If you make a simple mistake in unit conversions, or you punch the wrong buttons on your calculator, you get three quarters credit. If you get the right answer, you get full credit. However, if you don't show the algebraic solution, there's no credit at all. The best way to prepare for an exam like that is to do the homework problems the same way, following the three steps. Do the algebra, introduce numbers and units, and then enter the unit conversions.